Thank you all for coming. What a wonderful crowd. I see people I know that are members. I see people that are not members. I see people who have been members that didn't sign up this fall, perhaps, because they didn't have any class they wanted. But don't forget, we have winter classes. We have uh, how many, you know, do? Eight or ten winter classes. Twelve. Twelve, Twelve winter classes that are free to members. So if you're not a member, I have uh, some member applications up here. You get a $25 membership. Then any one of those 12 classes are free for you during the winter session. If you do sign up, then you will get a pamphlet that tells you what the classes are. So I encourage you to sign up. Also then, if you do sign up for those now, you already have signed up uh, as far as um, being a member goes for the spring classes. Uh, now I'd like to have Rachel uh, come up. I think she needs to have a few words. Good afternoon. Okay, folks, can you hear me? Yes. I'm going to have my raising three children voice now. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> you, you yeah, I got our president has given me permission to promote this. The Down Easter Barbershop Chorus and Quartet. You've got them on your table. If you need more of these, they are in the back table. Now, you all have heard about Community Little Theater signing this 99-year lease with the City of Auburn. Consequently, they have absorbed the building, the expenses, and everything that goes with it. They do need money, and the Down Easter Barbershop Chorus heard about that and came to Little Theater and offered to present their holiday concert and give all the proceeds to Little Theater. So I hope you will think about coming. It's $15 a person, December 10th, 7 p.m. at Little Theater on Academy Street in Harvard. And thank you for coming today to hear Charlie Plummer. And thank you if you decide to come to this. We would really appreciate it. Thank you. One more thing before I introduce June. I see our English teacher here. I see science teacher here. I see some, I think a math teacher is here. We need more teachers. <laughs> so if you have any idea of any kind of a course you would have, no matter how far out you think it is, uh, please contact us. We are looking for more instructors that we try to expand and have more classes for people to choose from. Now I'm introduced to Steele, who is the chair of the Food for Park Committee. <coughs> I taught for 37 years, but I never had a class this large, so I make my voice hurt. Uh, and lots of thank yous. Well, first of all, welcome. We have never, ever had this large a crowd. And we give Charles Plummer credit for it, but thank you all. And the first thank you I'd like to do is to Sandy Croft, because I know she's going to slip out that door any second. She's the liaison between Senior College and USM. And believe me, without her, we would not be here. She is a gem, and we thank you for all your help. <laughs> and today's helpers, we have Maureen Tibbetts and Donna Sweetser handling all that money back there. And for our food servers today, we have, um, let's see, make sure you have Pat Van Patella, Sharon McGilvery, Bono and Karen Bernier. Also, thanks to you who have indicated your willingness to be volunteers for this and other things. We have lists, we try to spread it around, and we, we will be in touch with you as the season goes on. Many thanks to volunteers for this and other things, too. Oh, next one. December 9th, Edward Little Chambers Singers Holiday Concert led by Beth Labrie. Should be a good thing to get us in the spirit a couple of weeks before the holidays. Come on out. Well, we have Charles Plummer in the wings here. I think if anyone deserves the title Renaissance Man, it's Charles, and you all know that without my saying it. Without going into all his background, 
he's given me a little introduction to get us right in the spirit of the day's events. Imagine now, November 18th, 1865, the American Civil War that began on April 12th, 1861, and ended on April 12th, 1865, with the formal surrender of Robert E. Lee's Army of the Northern Virginia, is over. It is with pleasure that I introduce to you General Joshua L. Chamberlain, who commanded the 20th Maine Infantry Regiment at the Battle of Gettysburg, and who will give us an overview of that terrible and bloody war that divided us as a nation for four long years at a tremendous cost of human lives. General Joshua Chamberlain. Thank you. It is an honor and a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, the train ride up from Brunswick this morning was peaceful and enjoyable. I couldn't help but think that with the approach of this coming Thanksgiving next Thursday, we have much to be thankful for. We can be thankful that that civil war that kept us a house divided is over and the union is restored. We can be thankful for the life of Abraham Lincoln, who died a tragic death at the hands of that dastardly actor John Wilkes Booth on April 14th at Ford's Theater. He guided us through those tumultuous four years that took the lives of 620,000 men and women. And I always add women because so many people don't realize that at least 400 women disguised themselves as men and fought during the war. And we know that one of them was killed at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. So the focus of my talk is going to be those events leading up to the war. Uh, and uh, I also want to talk a little bit about the role that the volunteers from Maine, Androscoggin County, and Lewiston and Auburn played, as well as the support provided by the citizens on the home front, which was uh, sig significant. One might say that the Civil War had its beginning back at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Richard Henry Lee, a delegate from Virginia, proposed that the Constitution contain a provision banishing slavery. Oh, he was an ancestor of General Robert E. Lee, by the way. And of course, that was such a contentious issue it was feared that if they only dwelt on that, the convention would end and the delegates would all go home without uh, even developing a constitution. And then someone came up with the thought, let's not, let's not bother with it. It will die out on its own in 70 years. Well, if you do your mathematics, it wasn't much more than 70 years. We fought the civil, the civil uh, war. The uh, first date, oh, let me just talk uh, briefly about the perception of the North and the South. Those perceptions uh, were quite significant. Number one, the North was developing into an industrialized nation. Capitalism was the key factor. The South was rural, agricultural, and the cotton crop represented 60% of the Southern economy. So th there were these perceptual uh, differences, and, and certainly the South believed that slavery was essential for keeping that kind of economy uh, going. Uh, there were other differences. The North was primarily the Republican Party prevailed in the South. The Democratic Party uh, pretty much prevailed. So we see a lot of these uh, differences as well. 
And that would, uh, those differences uh, extended over time. We had the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Missouri had wanted to come into the state two years earlier, but it would have upset the balance of power in Congress. So no way was Missouri going to be uh, admitted to the Union, but when Maine wanted to come in as a free state, that would keep the balance of power, so they both came in under the Compromise of 1820. And then we fought the war with Mexico, uh, Mexico in 1846 to 1848, and as a result of defeating Mexico, they turned over to our nation a vast tract of land that increased our country's size by one fifth. And what then became the issue, states were going to be carved out of that territory, but would they be free states or slaves? So you see, we, we have all of these events. Then we had the Compromise of 1850. We had the Dred Scott decision. And then Chief Justice Roger Tawney declared slavery is guaranteed under the Constitution of the United States. So we have all of these issues that finally came to a head with the election of President Abraham Lincoln in the election of 1860 and across South Carolina, fearing that Lincoln's objective would be to abolish slavery, seceded from the Union on December 20th of 1860. President James Buchanan made some feeble attempts to address that, but uh, nothing really came out of it. And then several more southern states seceded in support of South Carolina. Come April, several more upper southern states seceded from the Union because they did not want to furnish volunteers to fight against the other southern states. That was their reason for seceding from the Union. So, so we see a lot of these events leading up to war. Major Robert Anderson was commanding uh, a federal fort in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina with 100 troops. Now you can imagine that's like sticking a thorn in the side of South Carolina. And on the night of April 11th, 1861, uh, it was shortly after midnight, three men in a rowboat rode over to Fort Sumter. And as they approached the wharf, there, there were the torches lighting up the wharf area. And, and you could see reflected off these men, you could see the glint of their swords, and you could see that their uniforms were those of Confederates. And they requested to meet with, with Major Anderson and were escorted to meet with him. They spoke for about three hours. And then after about three hours, one handed him a note, and it said, if you do not surrender the fort in one hour, Confederate artillery will fire on the fort. Anderson says, I'm not surrendering the fort. This was the second time that he had uh, made that kind of a statement. So about 3.30, they got in their rowboats, rowed back to shore, and exactly one hour later, 4.30 a.m., you could see that first cannon shell arching across, firing on Fort Sumter, which of course started the Civil War. That was the opening shot. Lincoln immediately put on the call for 75,000 volunteers to serve for a period of three months. Uh, it was felt that the the North was so strong industrially, stronger with a larger population, that that's all it would take to force the Southern states back into the Union. Well, easier said than done. And under his call, Maine organized the first regiment of Maine infantry, which was a three-month infantry regiment. 